This is our eighth and final message in 2 Corinthians. We begin today's study in chapter 11, verse 24. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to chapter 11, verse 24, Paul is describing how he has suffered for Christ and doing the work of an apostle. He is trying to make the point that he is a true apostle to the uh, Corinthians. So let's pick it up. He says, five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Now, according to the Old Testament, it was illegal for the Jews to whip a criminal beyond 40 lashes. God wanted criminals punished and crime deterred. And he wanted the punishment to fit the crime, but he did not want criminals to be humiliated or killed. And Paul was whipped one less than the maximum. He was whipped 39 lashes on five different location or five different occasions I should say not for being a criminal but for being a Christian 25 he continues three times I was beaten with rods once I was stoned three times I was shipwrecked I spent a night and a day in the open sea I have been constantly on the move I have been in danger from rivers in danger from bandits in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled, and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And the Apostle didn't usually talk about himself like this. However, his spiritual integrity is being questioned and therefore his effectiveness for Christ is at stake that's why he's saying these things it's about Jesus not about him and so he speaks of all that he has endured because of his dedication to Christ and his love for people especially those who need to be saved after reading this no one should question Paul's spirituality or Paul's dedication to Christ the false teachers who slandered him promoted themselves they avoided saying anything that might get them in trouble but Paul preached Jesus and he preached the truth knowing that he would be persecuted for doing it 28 besides everything else I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches and he saved this one for last probably because it was the worst Paul was more concerned about people knowing and accepting truth and having their souls saved than he was his own comfort that man had his priorities in order and they were very unselfish priorities they were very God centered priorities and a close walk with God will give us an eternal perspective and will give us proper priorities as well. Look at verse 29. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? He at times felt weak. He at times burned on the inside. Some people think a Christian should dance through life feeling good all the time and if they're not happy all the time then there's something wrong with them or something wrong with their faith. It is a man-centered gospel which teaches that and it is wrong. It certainly isn't biblical because when you love Jesus like Paul did you're going to feel sad when others are hurt and you will be angry at things that hurt others and at times you're going to be disturbed that you cannot do more and make things better verse 30 if I must boast I will boast of the things that show my weakness and that certainly wasn't like the false teachers the false teachers boasted about 
how good they had it. They didn't have the problems Paul had because they compromised truth whenever it threatened their happiness. And to the ignorant, they look strong. Oh, look, they don't have any problems. Well, wow, they're strong spiritually. It says, I brag about those things that make me look weak. Things like being sad over the physical and spiritual condition of others. 31. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of Damascus guarded in order to arrest me, but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. And this first dangerous situation Paul suffered occurred shortly after he became a Christian. The rest of his life followed suit until he had his head chopped off because of his faith. And again, the false teachers didn't have those problems because they said and did things that caused them to fit in with the ungodly. They cared more about their own comfort than the souls of people. Chapter 12 I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. Paul says he's going to now talk about revelations from God that he received. And he knows it really won't do any good. It will not convince the hard-hearted that he is an apostle of Christ. But he will speak it because it is truth. Two, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. God knows. Stop right there for a second. Paul is that man, by the way. He is talking about himself. And he mentions the third heaven. The third heaven is where faithful souls go after they die. The apostle saw God's heaven. Look at verse 4. Well, actually, the last part of verse 3. Whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexplicable things, things that man is not permitted to tell. The things Paul saw in heaven were so unbelievable that he couldn't even describe them. He could take it in, but he did not have the ability to communicate it. That is how good departed Christians have it right now. As we sit here on earth, trying our best, struggling with sin, trying to make a living, whatever it might be, that's how good Christians have it in heaven. It is too good to explain, but fortunately, not too good for them to enjoy. 5. I will boast about a man like that but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say or do. Paul has much to boast about. He could boast all day and all night, but he does not want anyone to focus on him or to think too highly of him. Paul could have talked about all the special revelations he received from God and all the great things God had done through him. He could have talked about all those things for a long time, but he will hold back. It is okay to talk about the things that God is doing through us until we sense that people are thinking more about us than God. Then we should back off. 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Amazing experiences with God were balanced off with the correct amount of trouble allowed by God and delivered by the devil. 
God sometimes allows trouble to keep us from becoming too arrogant. Sinful human beings can only handle a certain amount of success before it goes to their head and leads to sin. Verse 8 Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Paul prayed for God to heal him three times. Which leads me to say this, it is not wrong or a sign someone lacks faith to pray for something more than once. And the word of faith teachers say that. Well, I don't ever pray for something the second time or it cancels the faith that accompanied your prayer the first time. How stupid. How stupid. Jesus repeated prayers. Paul repeated prayers. Repetition in prayer is not wrong. You can pray for something a hundred times. A million times. Repetition in prayer is not wrong. Vain repetition is the thing that Christ condemned. And the emphasis is not on repetition, but on vain. Verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God said no to what Paul asked for. And he told him, I'm all you need. Sometimes God says no to good things in order to show us that He can give us the grace and the strength to make it through bad things. Last part of verse 9. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. See, once Paul understood that God was actually using his sicknesses, he was okay with the no answer. Once he understood God was using the no answer, he was okay with the no answer. And it is important for us to understand that God has a reason for saying no to our prayers. And we don't need to know what the reason is. It is enough to know there is a reason. It is important for us to understand that God is using the bad that he allows to accomplish something he could not otherwise accomplish. Verse 10 That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul looked at how he made it through hard times you know, he stepped back and he recognized that it was that it was God's power at work in him that made him make it. Through those difficulties, he learned that God's grace was real, and that knowledge kept him going and gave him joy. He saw God working in him, and that gave him joy. And the more we see God working in us, the greater our joy will be. Even if our circumstances are not everything we want them to be. 11. I have been, or I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, but I am not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. The Corinthians should have recognized that God sent Paul to them and God used him as an apostle. If they would have if they would have had the spiritual sense to recognize that, then he would not have needed to talk about it himself. Twelve. The things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, miracles, were done among you with great perseverance. How were you inferior to the other churches? Except that I was never a burden to you. Forgive me this wrong. The only thing Paul did not do in Corinth was ask for something. He was all giving and no taking. And he says that he's sorry about that. And I believe he was. 
They should have been taught to give to the one who served them. And I think Paul was sorry that he didn't emphasize that. He didn't do them any favors. Maybe that's why they acted like a bunch of spoiled brats at times. I mean, if you give a child something, you just keep giving and giving and giving and never give them any responsibilities. I wouldn't want to see that child when they grow up. 14. Now I'm ready to visit you for the third time and I will not be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions but you. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents but parents for their children. Paul wanted them, not something from them. He wanted their fellowship in Christ. He wanted to get along. That's how God is. God wants us. He wants us to have a heart for Him. And He wants us to get along with Him. Verse 15. So I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? And that's the way it seemed. The nicer Paul was to them, the worse they were to him. But whatever. He will continue to do what he can do to make them stronger spiritually. Whether they appreciate it or not. Because being good to others is more about pleasing Christ than it is about being appreciated by those that we help. 16. Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you, yet crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. No matter how much of the non-demanding, no matter how much of a non-demanding servant Paul was, some still questioned his motives, saying, oh, his kindness is just to trap people. Jesus went through the same thing. Think about it. After three years of giving to others, doing good things for others, healing others, raising people from the dead, restoring families, the people concluded that he should be crucified, that he was evil. How you can get that out of that, I don't know. But it happens. 17. Did I exploit you through any of the men I sent you? I urged Titus to go to you, and I sent our brother with him. Titus did not exploit you, did he? Did we not act in the same spirit and follow the same course? Paul did not take advantage of the Corinthians himself or through a third party either. He didn't take advantage of them. He wasn't, you know, underhanded. He wasn't trying to trap them. Godly people are not underhanded. Godly people do not use double talk. They do not deceive. And they do not trick people into doing things. The Bible says we have renounced the hidden things of darkness. 19. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, factions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impure sexual sin and debauchery in which they have indulged. And notice what he says. In verse 20, For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. If the apostle comes to Corinth and does not like what he sees among the Corinthians, then they will not like how Paul will act toward them either. That's how it works with God. If he does not like how we act, 
and we continue to act that way then we will not like how he acts towards us either it will not be a good thing chapter 13 this will be my third visit to you every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses and this verse is why we cannot build a doctrine on only one verse of scripture if something is to be taught as doctrine for us then it needs to be backed by at least two or three scriptures the cults are very good at taking an obscure text and building an entire doctrine on it but that's very bad hermeneutics biblical interpretation verse 2 I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time I now repeat it while absent on my return I will not spare those who earlier or any of the others he has warned next time he will punish the Bible says warn someone two or three times after that act put a stop to it make sure people understand the consequences before they are punished is the lesson verse 3 since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me he is not weak in dealing with you but is powerful among you notice they had gone astray but Jesus being true to his word not to leave or forsake his own is still trying to get them to repent when we ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior he takes that seriously it means if we go astray we can expect him to do whatever he has to do to try to bring us back and that, always won't, that won't always feel very good either verse 4 so to be sure he that is Jesus was crucified in weakness yet he lives by God's power likewise we are weak in him yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you Jesus looked very weak while he was on the cross but he wasn't he was doing the greatest work ever done as he paid for our sins and Paul looked weak outwardly he was sickly he did not have a strong voice but when he spoke the word of God the Holy Spirit went to work through him weak vessel doesn't matter and no matter how weak the human vessel may be if that person will only speak the word of God the Holy Spirit will use them to do remarkable things for God's glory 5 examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless of course you fail the test and I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test praying the uh, so called sinner's prayer to receive Christ praying that prayer or maybe being confirmed and then standing on those things for the assurance of our salvation is reckless and unbiblical the Bible says examine yourself to see if you are a Christian examine yourself if there's no desire to please Jesus and there's no desire for holiness and no need to confess and repent after you sin then there's no salvation and it's better for people to understand that that's the way it is while they still have time to ask Christ to save them and be their Lord because eternity is way too long and hell is way too horrible to go there 7 now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong not that people will see that we had the test but that you will do what is right even though we may seem to have failed Paul did not care if he came across looking successful or not he prayed that the Corinthians would be holy not so he would get credit for being a good teacher but because it was right to be holy Eight, for we cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth in other words our business as Christians is to encourage people to believe what is true and live the right way and we are not called to be neutral we are called to be promoters of what is good 
whether people listen or not. Verse 9. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is for your perfection. Paul says, you know, it doesn't matter if he's weak or strong. It doesn't matter how he comes across. What people thought of Paul really didn't matter to him as long as it did not interfere with his ministry to make others more like Christ. What people thought of him didn't matter. And so anytime you see a so-called Christian celebrity or some other Christian promoting themselves and using Jesus to do it, it should make us sick to our spiritual stomachs. When the apostles or even the holy angels saw that people were focusing on them, they quickly rebuked those people and told them to focus on God because the only Christian celebrity there is is Jesus. 10. This is why I write these things when I am absent. That when I come, I not have to be harsh in the use of my authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. A pastor sometimes has to use his authority to protect the good Christians in the church. And sometimes it means you've got to be harsh. That means telling spiritual troublemakers who are a threat to leave and not come back. 11. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And all these things that Paul mentions in this verse, they all kind of feed off each other. If we love God's word and we live God's word, then we're going to be happy. We're going to have peace. And if those around us do the same thing, everyone will get along. On the other hand, a self-focus instead of a God-focus will always show itself in some kind of sin and will for sure rip harmony to pieces and steal any happiness as well. 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Today we shake hands. All the saints send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Notice verse 14. Notice the reference to the Trinity here. It's failed, but it's there. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are mentioned together, but separately. That is the Trinity. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, it's true. But the fact of the Trinity is in the Bible. It's important. Sound teaching that is categorized and labeled like the Trinity is absolutely essential to oppose heretics. It's important to define orthodox truth so that false teaching can be easily recognized. Thank you for joining me in the book of 2 Corinthians. We go on to Galatians next time. Until then, so long everyone.